So uh, Big Brother is not only watching, he's also taking notes. <laughs> well, I haven't followed him all the way yet. Uh, I have still one more trip to make to Northern Europe that he's made. <laughs> anyway, I'm very, very happy to speak to you today. This is my way of saying thank you to the KITP, the finest institution of its kind. I've been coming there for years and years, and I've not kept my admiration of it secret from the people who run it, to the funding agencies, and so on. I also want to thank the city and the people of Santa Barbara for several idyllic months, which are unfortunately uh, coming to an end. Unless I follow David and end up here, I'm confined to the East Coast for the near future. Now, the topics I usually choose for public lectures are either quantum mechanics or relativity. I'm nervous today because uh, with quantum mechanics, I'm not in the least worried whether you will follow me or not, because I don't follow it. So. It has been stated that nobody understands the subject. So my goal in that case is to begin the hour when only I don't understand it and finish the hour when no one in the room understands it. <laughs> but relativity is more reasonable, so there is a good chance we can explain it. Some other things are strange, but uh, if you want to know the difference, in relativity, someone will tell you, I saw a guy who was 18 feet tall. It's a little strange, but you can deal with it. Quantum mechanics, they will tell you, I saw the same guy in two places at the same time. That's how different the subjects are. It's very hard to make that intuitive. Now, relativity needs very little mathematics besides algebra. But I've been told by our uh, development office at KITP that every equation I write down is going to cost them $186,000 per equation. So. There will be no equations today. And it's going to be no child left behind, no grown-ups left behind. You can all follow me. All right. So the standard trick uh, for teaching the subject begins with uh, two trains, which I'm going to show, show you. This is the top view of the trains. They're parked in the station. This is train number one. And this is train number two. These are supposed to be infinitely long trains, but Greg could not find me infinitely long green boards, so you should imagine the rest of it. So just imagine, here are the two trains, and you're looking down at the trains from the top. So you get into this, this train, and you sit down, and you observe the world around you. You can observe it any way you like. You can play ping pong, you can pour yourself a drink, or if you're a physicist, you reach into your pocket, pull out your mass and spring system, and you attach it to the wall, and you watch it go back and forth, and time flies that way. So, <laughs> so you entertain yourself any way you want. Then you notice there's another train right next to you, also standing in the station. At this point, uh, they close all the blinds. The reason is not that the train is going to certain parts of New Jersey. This is because of a deep experiment that's going to happen now. They close the blinds, and you go to sleep. And you wake up, and you are told one of two things has happened when you were sleeping. One is nothing happened. The train is left alone. Other is that while you were sleeping, it was given a velocity of 100 miles per hour. Can you tell which is happening? Can you tell if the train is moving or not? Now, you cannot say, I know the train is not moving because it says Amtrak up there. <laughs> now, in saying that, you're showing rugged common sense, but it's not a good physics answer. It's what we call in physics the right answer for the wrong reasons. You have to find out the correct way by doing experiments. And Galileo, who is the father of relativity, if you want the grandfather, 300 years ago said, you can never tell if the train is moving or not. That's almost half of the principle of relativity. As long as the train is going at constant velocity, you will never know. Now, where is the relative of relativity? It comes when you open the window and look at the other train. So you see the other train going the other way at some speed, maybe 100 miles an hour. 
No one will deny that there is some motion between you and the other train, but you can never tell who is actually moving. There's no way to tell. You can tell that it's a motion, but it's called relative because it doesn't produce any effects in your train that you can detect. Now, if you look at the other side, if you open the window the other side, you see a lot of cows. The cows are running at 100 miles an hour. So now we have to decide, is it the train or is it the cows? Now, much as you hate to admit the Amtrak can move, it's hard to believe that cows move at 100 miles an hour, so you may conclude maybe the train is moving. But these are all spurious arguments because it's quite possible somebody put a whole bunch of cows on a platform and started dragging it in the opposite direction. I don't think anyone will go to such lengths to fool you, but the claim is that if they did, you would not know. So this is the first principle of relativity. It's not changed in all these years. If you sit inside a closed train and you don't look outside, you cannot tell the difference between sitting in the platform and going at a constant velocity. So in that sense, all of you have experienced it and all of you know what it means. So you can sort of say this is the end of the principle, but you know, I got some more time, so I'll continue this story now. There's one part of motion you can't detect. It's not that you cannot detect the motion. If the train accelerates, for example, if the engine engineer slams on the brake, you will slam into the seat in front of you. At that moment, you don't have to look outside to know you're in a state of deceleration. Previously, if you looked outside the window and saw the other person, you could say, I'm not moving, you're moving. But now, when you're decelerating and you slammed your face into the seat, you cannot tell the other person, I'm the one who's at rest, you are accelerating the other direction. You cannot tell him anything because first of all, you've lost all your teeth. And you don't, you don't have a case to make because he will say, if you're the one who is at rest and I'm moving, how come you have no teeth and I do? You will have to agree that in this case, you are the one who is accelerating. So accelerated motion is real. In the sense it makes a difference to a person inside. You don't have to compare to the outside world. So that's what Galileo said. So after Galileo comes Newton. And what Newton did was to show you, to demonstrate to you that you're in a moving train at constant velocity, you cannot tell you're moving. In other words, Galileo observed it. Newton was able to demonstrate it using his laws of motion. So there are three laws of motion. Two of them involve equations, so I won't go there. But the first law of Newton is the law of inertia, which, as you know, <laughs> says that if you take an object and you leave it somewhere, it will stay there forever, like all these objects here, unless it's acted upon by a force. Or if the object had a velocity to begin with, it will continue to have the velocity unless you intervene. So that's the law of Newton. Now what I want to show you is that if the law of Newton is, works for me, if it works for me when the train is at rest on the platform, it will also work when the train is going at a constant velocity. That's what I want to show you. Now, if the laws of Newton, namely the law of inertia, holds for you, you're called an inertial observer. So what I want to show you is that if you are an inertial observer, somebody going in a train at a constant velocity is also an inertial observer. But you can actually prove that. So here's the way you prove it. So here's a side view of the train, looking at the train from the side through one of the glass windows. And there is a table here. There's a guy uh, sitting. If you cannot see this art, it's actually OK, because it looks pretty bad even from here. But this is a guy sitting next to a table, and there's a mug of beer uh, kept uh, foolishly on a frictionless table. OK, now, you are told the train is going at 160 miles an hour, let us say. That's the speed of the train. And the train will always go at 60. This beer mug started at 60 miles an hour. You are allowed to use Newton's laws because you're not in the train. You're on the ground. You're inertial. So you know this mug will keep going at 60 miles an hour because there are no forces on it. There's no force of friction. So it has to go at the same speed. So you conclude that this is going at the same speed as this guy forever. That means the distance between them will not change. That means from the point of view of the person on the train, this beer mug will stay where it was. So you can conclude based on what you know 
what he will say, namely, a mug at rest will stay at rest. Similarly, you can show if the mug had a certain velocity, to begin with, it will preserve that velocity. But all of this fails if the train has an acceleration. If the train accelerates, what's going to happen is this guy is going to pick up speed because he's in the train. The mug will not pick up any speed. It's on a frictionless table, which has no way of changing its speed. So you know what will happen. This was going at 60. This guy is going at 60, then 70 and 80. He's going to slam into this mug. That means from the point of view of this person, the mug will slide backwards and hit him. So then he will know that loss of inertia do not apply to him. Because in that accelerating train, whatever you leave, if it's not nailed to the ground, it's going to slide backwards. So we all know this. When you go on a plane, when the plane takes off, when it's accelerating forward, all this stuff slides to the back of the plane. That's where the physics guys are, collecting everything. Okay. <laughs> then when the plane lands, everything rolls to the front of the plane, and we are there too. To us, that's what economy plus means. We sit in the front row <laughs> and we collect. Okay, so somebody was trying to say earlier how useful physics is. This is one of the illustrations. All right, so what have we learned from Newton and Galileo is that uniform velocity doesn't matter. Non-uniform velocity matters in the sense that you can feel it. It's not relative. You cannot talk your way out of it. Okay, so I've gone on this long, and you know that I will eventually have to bring in a subject, a topic. So can anybody guess what it is that sure to come up at some point on any talk on Einstein? Pardon me? Uh, Elevator is coming later. Something else. <laughs> the most, most popular thing. No? Light. Thank you. So light has to come in, right? So it's going to come in now. So everyone knew that the speed of light is an interesting topic. Uh, Alfred E. Newman, one of my mentors, <laughs> used to say that this is what he knows about the velocity of light. It comes here too early in the morning. <laughs> so after that, every other statement is a kind of anticlimax. But I will tell you what other people, lesser men, had to say about this. So Galileo wanted to measure the speed of light. So what Galileo did was to go to a mountain, and his friend went to another mountain. I don't know, they're 20 miles apart. So here's Galileo standing on this mountain, and here's the friend. So they're both holding lanterns with a lamp inside and a shutter you can open and close very quickly. So here's the arrangement Galileo made. He said, I'll open my shutter. The minute I do it, the light will go to you. And when you see that light, you open your shutter, and it'll come back to me, and I'll see how long it took. I take the distance, I divide by the time, I'll get the velocity. So he did that, he got an answer, which is much faster than the velocity of sound. But Galileo, being a very careful person, he repeated the experiment with another mountain and got the same time delay. So you have to think about how you can get the same answer if it's going much further. And the answer is that he was not really measuring the time it took light to travel. He was measuring how long it took for his friend to react to the signal. That's why he kept getting the same delay. And we know that Galileo had no chance of finding the speed of light by any of these measurements, because we know light travels around the world about seven times every second, and if you're 20 miles apart, you cannot measure it. So the real success in measuring the speed of light came from an astronomer called Romer, and this was his trick for finding the velocity of light. <coughs> So here is the sun, and here is the earth, and here is Jupiter, and it's one of its moons is going round and round. Let's say it goes around every hour. Every time it comes in front of a certain spot in Jupiter, <coughs> you get a signal, and you mark that in your lab notebook, and you say, I got a pulse. The moon goes around one more time and comes to the same spot. 
you get another pulse. You keep recording these pulses, they're roughly one hour apart. But then you find as you wait for more and more pulses, they start coming late. The next pulse, which is supposed to come here, I'm exaggerating it, comes there. So each pulse is getting systematically delayed. And he was able to figure out why it was getting delayed. It was getting delayed because the experiment began when the Earth was here, but as time goes by, the Earth is moving away in its orbit, and six months later, it is over here. In this approximation, the Jupiter can be taken to be fixed. So the light originally came there, and the pulse six months later had to travel the diameter of the solar system. And that's the time delay, it's like 15 or 20 minutes. You can imagine, you need something on that scale to make a measurement. So using that time delay, which is the time to go across this uh, 200 million miles, he was able to get the velocity of light, and his estimate was two times, it's 200,000 kilometers per second. But the correct answer is 300,000. So it was a very, very good uh, measurement, given the quantity he's measuring. So it was demonstrated by him that light travels at a finite speed. And that's all you knew about light. Didn't know anything else. Until the next experiment, performed by somebody, an English physicist called Young, who showed that light is a wave. So this is very important, so you have to follow this. So when I say something is a wave, I'm saying something very specific. So you know there are waves in water, there are waves in air, Stuff is going up and down. Waves display phenomenon that nothing else can. It's called interference. So I've got to explain it to you people. And I want to use a language that the average person in Santa Barbara can relate to, at least my view of the average person in Santa Barbara. So uh, here is the ocean. Here is your estate. <laughs> and here is your yacht. Okay. You're sitting in your yacht, just relaxing after a hard day's work. But then somebody builds an oil rig here and starts sending, sending waves towards your yacht. So it's rocking the boat up and down. So you take prompt action and you build a barrier here. You put a barrier in front of your yacht and your estate, then you're fine. But then, one day, something goes wrong. Uh, there's a hole in the barrier. So let me draw you the picture of what happens. So here's the barrier you built, and here is your boat and your estate, and there's suddenly a hole in front of this. So water's coming through, the waves are coming through, and once more you're unhappy. So suppose you call me as your consultant and say, hey, what should I do? I'll say, do you have any cement or concrete? And you say, you don't have anything. How about a sledgehammer? You say, I have a sledgehammer. So what I do is I take your sledgehammer and make a second hole there. Turns out that can actually solve the problem if I make it at the right location. The reason is that you might think a second hole is going to make things worse, but the second hole is going to send its own waves. And you can see that these two signals are not coming at the same time here. So when the signal from here says to the boat, go up, signal from here can say, go down. And when that says, go down, this will say, go up. You can arrange it so that whatever this one says, that says the opposite. You can make it go just half a wavelength longer. You can cancel them. That's the way to cancel the waves. And waves are peculiar in the sense that making one more hole can actually reduce the activity here. Now, of course, uh, that's the person living directly in front of the two holes. <laughs> but that's your neighbor, and that's not your problem. Because <laughs> you didn't get to where you are worrying about the other guy. So, <laughs> so that's his problem. OK. Now, this works only for waves. For example, if you have a mosquito net, and uh, there's a hole in the mosquito net, and mosquitoes are coming in, you cannot make a second hole to neutralize them. Now, why is that? Because there are no negative mosquitoes, only zero or one or two or three. So you cannot fight mosquitoes with more mosquitoes. So it only works for waves. 
That's the moral of the story. If anything displaces interference, then you're dealing with a wave. That's what Young did. You can replace uh, this oil rig by a source of light, and he took an opaque sheet and made two holes in it and put another screen behind that. And behind that were patterns of bright and dark and bright and dark as he moved across. And that's what shows you it's a wave. OK, so this is learning more about light. It's a wave. But you don't know what exactly is waving. What's the thing that's shaking up and down? Because with water waves, we know it's water. If you wiggle a string, you know it's a string moving up and down. When I talk to you, um, my diaphragm is setting the air into motion back and forth. So it's always something that's moving. It is not clear what it is that's a wave, but it's showing interference. So the answer to that came from a guy called Maxwell, who was studying electromagnetic theory. Now, you're all familiar with some aspects of electromagnetism. So electricity, as you know, is what happens when you walk on a carpet and try to put your key against the doorknob and you get a spark. Or your socks stick together in the dryer, that's electricity. Now, magnetism has been known from the time of ancient Greeks when parents noticed that children were sticking their artwork on the refrigerator using little black rocks. <laughs> and they were eventually used to make compasses. So we know electricity and magnetism are very familiar to you. What Maxwell showed is that that can be waves of electricity and magnetism, or electromagnetic waves. That means if a wave comes towards you, uh, if it's a real wave in the ocean and it passes you, you will jump up and down. If it's an electromagnetic wave and you hold an electron in your hand, it'll jump up and down. That's, that's what is changing. And Maxwell also went on to calculate the velocity of these waves. It's a very interesting calculation. If you want to find the velocity of waves on a string, you can calculate it using Newton's laws. You just have to know how tense the string is and how dense it is. You put them all in, you get a formula. So what Maxwell did is, again, take two numbers, one measures the strength of the electric force between charges, and one measures the magnetic force between currents, put the product of the numbers together, and got the velocity. The velocity he got was 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, he immediately recognized as the velocity of light. So Maxwell immediately proclaimed that light was just an electromagnetic wave. You've got to be careful when you say that, because just because it has the same velocity doesn't mean it's the same thing. For example, I'm walking here now. Suppose Brad Pitt starts walking next to me at the same speed. He doesn't become me, no matter how badly he wants it. <laughs> so velocity is just one aspect of something. It's not the same thing. So we know nowadays that gravity waves travel at the same speed. But Maxwell is right. It turns out it is really light, is really electromagnetic waves. All right. So this is followed by a great period of euphoria when we finally understood one of the big mysteries, what is, what is light, electromagnetism. And he had calculated the speed, but then that led to an immediate problem, a paradox. Whenever you find the speed of something, you find the speed in the medium in which it travels. The speed of sound that I tell you is whatever 700 and something miles per hour, it's the speed with respect to the air. If you start zooming along sound wave at some speed, its speed will appear less to you. In fact, if you go faster than sound, you can leave it behind. So there's nothing called the speed of sound. It depends on who is looking at it, and it's usually calculated in the medium that supports it. Similarly, when you find the velocity of waves on a string, it means if you pluck the string and let it go, the ripple will travel at that speed, as seen by a guy for whom the string overall is at rest. If you start running along the blip, you can slow it down, you can stop it, you can have it go backwards. So Maxwell says the speed of light is c. He doesn't tell you according to whom. Who's supposed to measure this? In fact, if you look at his calculation, there's no mention of any particular person. You just take electric fields and magnetic fields, throw them in the mix, and out comes the speed. But if people said, look, everything that has a wave has to be the wave of something. We don't know any other examples where it's not true. So we're going to say that is a medium called ether. And we know the ether is everywhere. 
You know, it's everywhere because I can look at the stars. If there's no ether, I couldn't see the light from the stars. So ether is everywhere. And that's what carries light waves. And the speed Maxwell calculated must have been the speed with respect to that medium, all pervasive medium in the entire universe. Now, that means if you go measure the speed of light one day, you will not get the answer C. You understand that? That's the speed in this medium. If you're moving in that medium in the same direction as the light pulse, you will get a lesser speed. If you're moving in the opposite direction, you'll get a greater speed. So Michelson and Morley said, we'll find out what our speed is, the speed of the Earth at the moment. They measure it. The idea is this. You measure the speed of light, you compare it to Maxwell's answer, and the difference is your speed. They measure the speed of light, they get exactly C. So maybe by some accident, on the day they made the measurement, the Earth, their lab was at rest with respect to this ether. That cannot last very long, because the Earth is spinning. And if one instant is going this way, 12 hours later is going the other way, your lab. You make a measurement 12 hours later, you make it six months later, you make it daytime, nighttime, any time you get the same answer. The speed of light was just coming out to be the same, independent of the state of motion of the person measuring it. And that was a big problem. So people tried various ways to fix it. One way is to say, look, uh, right now in this room, we're all zooming through space. We measure the velocity of sound. We get the same speed calculated in the textbook. The reason is that we're carrying the air with us. So the speed doesn't change because of the motion of the Earth, because the medium supporting the wave is carried along with you. Same thing in a plane. I get into a plane. Plane is at rest. I ask the flight attendant for a pillow. It takes about one femtosecond for the person to pretend he didn't hear me. Then when the plane takes off, going at high speed, I ask for a pillow again, same delay between my asking and getting ignored. Why? Because I'm taking the air with me in the plane, so the speed doesn't change. That's, that's what I would put my money on if in those days, that the Earth carries the ether with it. But there are other experiments where you look at very distant stars and ask how you got it tilt your telescope as you go around the sun. They don't agree with the notion of dragging the ether with you. So you cannot take it with you. You cannot leave it behind. That is the big problem. So that is the point at which Einstein, who you've been waiting to hear about, enters the game. This is all prior to Einstein and the big mystery of the velocity of light. So Einstein said, I know why light's behaving in this strange way, giving you the same answer no matter how you move. He said, remember back in Galileo's days, he talked about going in this moving train and not being able to find your speed because everything behaves the same. Well, if the speed of light differed with how fast the train was moving, then you could wake up without looking outside, remeasure the speed of light, and whatever difference you got is the speed you acquired when you were sleeping. But you cannot do that, that because if you could do that, then the principle of relativity doesn't work for light. It works for mechanics, but doesn't work for optics. Now, he was unwilling to believe that in the physics book, the first 10 chapters obey relativity and the last few do not. He said, if you believe in relativity, it should work for everything. So the constant speed of light is part of a conspiracy to hide your velocity from you. It behaves that way, so you cannot tell whether you're moving or not. So it's really reinforcing Galileo's principle or Newton's principle, a very old principle, but now it embraces electromagnetism as part of the conspiracy. So he basically said the speed of light is a constant because if it wasn't a constant, you would violate relativity. So that doesn't look like uh, such a great statement because he's basically postulating the speed of light will be constant. So what, what's he so famous for? Well, what he did in the bargain was to make a pretty, uh, put himself in a corner because here's, here's what he's saying. He's saying, I know the speed of light has to be constant. But think about what it means. I'm going to give an example so you understand how dramatic it is. All right, so here is a road, and some vehicle is traveling. Let's say it's traveling at 60 MPH, and you start traveling at 40 MPH. 
you know you should get a speed of 60 minus 40 of 20. Now, replace this car by a light pulse traveling at speed C. Imagine you're traveling at 3 fourths the speed of C. You expect to, let's say I'm at, on the ground, here's the light pulse, you are going at 3 fourths the speed of C. I expect you to get 1 fourth C because you've got to take away the 3 fourths. But you get C again. Think about it. There's no example in daily life where something has the same speed for everybody. Something has to give. So what can possibly be wrong? Uh, why do I think, why do, how do I understand you getting the value C when I know you should get C over 4? So I say, look, I know what you did. You saw how far light traveled. You divided by the time, and you took distance over time, and you got the velocity, and you have screwed up somewhere in the process. One thing you could have done wrong is that you and I had these meter sticks, which we bought in the same store, and which are completely identical, but now we are in this moving frame. Some of your meter stick has become short by a factor of four. Therefore, when light travels one meter, you think it traveled four meters. So you exaggerate the answer by a factor of four, and instead of getting C over four, you get C. That could be another way you're getting this exaggerated velocity. Maybe your clocks, which used to agree with my clocks, are now slowing because you're in this moving car. And they're slowed by a factor of four. So when light has traveled for four seconds, you think it's been only one second, and you divide by one instead of four, then also you can get four times the answer. In fact, you can imagine there are many ways in which you could be wrong about length and time. Looks like there is no unique answer, but there is when Einstein also demanded that whatever I say about your rods and clocks, you should be able to say about my rods and clocks. That's the second equation. If you put them together, you find out that that's a certain way in which you and I will disagree on length and on time. So here is the remarkable thing about Einstein was he believed so much in the principle of relativity that he was willing to sacrifice something very cherished, which is notions of space and time, which have been there forever, he said, well, if that has to go, it has to go. But the relativity principle is more important to me than saving your notions of space and time. So in the remaining time, I'm just going to tell you some of the things he deduced, some of the things he figured out, which we can all figure out now, given just this information. OK, so let me start. I'm going to talk mainly about time and not about space, because it's much more interesting. So I want you to imagine the following situation. A pair of twins is born, one in Los Angeles and one in New York. Are you listening to me? <laughs> OK. You know, when I told that to my students, they said, that that's not an ordinary mother who can do this. <laughs> it's the mother from the Yo Mama jokes. Yo Mama is so big, she can have kids in two parts of the country. So. Let's forget that particular instance and take two kids who are not related, just born in two ends of the country, one in LA, one in New York. And that is the sense in which we can say they were born at the same time. We are not fooled by the fact that when it's 12 o'clock here, it's 3 o'clock there. We can take care of all that. That's a sense in which something happens now. Here, it happens there at the same time. So imagine two kids born at the same time, but separated by 3,000 miles. In Einstein's theory, if there's another observer moving in a rocket or any other form, that person will not agree that these two events were simultaneous. He will say that one kid was born first, the other kid was born first. We've got to understand, where does he get this? How are you going to deduce that? So here is the example. Here is one way to understand how he got his result. He's going to do the following. He's going to make me arrange two events to be simultaneous to the best of my ability and show that for anybody else moving relative to me, they will not be simultaneous. So here's the famous thing. So here is the train in which I am. I think my train is at rest. So let's pretend it's at rest. I want to arrange a simultaneous explosion here and here at the two ends of my train. So I do that by taking these two mirrors at some right angles and I send a light pulse that divides itself and goes to the left and goes to the right. It's right in the middle, splits and goes both ways, hits the counter here, 
triggers an explosion, hits a counter there and triggers an explosion. They are simultaneous. You cannot find any fault in my way of engineering that a simultaneous event. But if you are in another frame of reference in which you think I'm actually not at rest, but I'm moving to the right at some speed, you will not agree they're simultaneous. You will say, I send this light pulse like this, it goes this way and that way, both at the same speed C. Because the speed of light is the same for everybody. But this end of the train is moving to meet the light pulse, and that end of the train is running away from the light pulse. Therefore, it will hit the rear end of the train first, and this explosion will happen before that explosion. So we will not agree on that. And you can say, why are you talking about light all the time? Why not send a couple of pigeons, tell them to go in opposite directions? Well, we don't know the dynamics of pigeons. We know as little about them as they know about relativity. The pigeons are no good. You can send a couple of guys from FedEx. You know they'll get there absolutely positively by 10 o'clock, but you don't know how much before 10 o'clock. So any, anything you use, including standing in the room and shouting, we don't know how sound behaves either. But because of the postulate, the velocity of light, you know that if using a light signal, you can find there's a time difference between these two events. It's a real time difference. We can calculate it. So two events which are simultaneous for me have a different story for the other person. This happened first, and that happened later. And if you have a person who thinks the train is going that way, that person will say that this happened later, and that happened first. So you take any pair of events, People cannot agree on whether, they, whether A occurred before B, whether they're simultaneous, or B occurred before A. Now, if you were Einstein and you realize this is happening in your theory, you should be pretty nervous because you cannot just screw around with the order of events. Here are two events. Event one, my father is born. Event two, I am born. We all think my father's birth was first and then my birth is second. What if there is some observer for whom I am born, the father is not yet born? Here I am lying in the hospital, and the nurse says, uh, call the dad. We've got to give the baby a name. They say, the dad is not here. You mean he's in the parking lot? I said, no, he's not born yet. There's no father yet. That can actually happen. In the meantime, someone can go and attack my grandmother. Grandmothers come in all relativistic theories. They can attack my grandmother and make sure my father doesn't even appear in the scene then what am I doing? So you cannot allow some events to be exchanged in that order. But they are special kind of events. They are events in which the first event is the cause of the second event. In this case, my father's presence was the cause behind my presence. Then you can never find an observer for whom the order is reversed. But other occasions when one event is not the cause of the other, they could be exchanged without any paradoxes. So you can go to the theory and ask the theory, hey, when do you preserve the order of events, and when, you, when do you let them switch around? And there's a very definite answer in the theory. The answer is this. If from the first event, I can send a signal that arrives in time of the second event using a light pulse, then the first event could have been the cause of the second event. May not be, but if that's possible, we have to admit it could have been the cause. Then the theory won't let you exchange their order. But if there is no time, even for a light pulse to go from the first event to the second event, the theory then demands that they could not be causally connected. That means the first event could not have been the cause of the second event. For this all to work, nothing should travel faster than light. Because if there are signals going faster than light, you can actually have a problem, which is why when some people found uh, somewhere in Europe, that there are these possibility of particles traveling faster than light. Uh, a lot of us didn't lose any sleep over it, not but because we're blindly uh, faithful to Einstein, but we realized that if that happened, you would violate causality. Then you might as well pack it up and go home. Because no matter how little we believe in, we all believe in the causal world. So that's how uh, that problem is resolved in this theory. It's a very beautiful way in which Order of events are reversed when allowed and not reversed when not allowed. The final thing I want to mention is about clocks. 
So here is the way you show in Einstein's theory that clocks will run slower when they're moving. So it depends on the kind of clock you use. If you use the clock in my hand, it doesn't help because when I open it, I don't see anything. Nothing's moving. So we want a clock that people like me can understand. Somebody who cannot get the clock in his VCR to start. For such people, that is an experiment in which this is how the clock works. You take two mirrors some distance apart, and a light pulse just goes back and forth and back and forth between them. And every time it does a round trip, it triggers a counter here and registers one click. That's my clock. Now you buy another clock, just like me. That means if you place it next to mine, it'll have the same height, and that's your signal. And we are both synchronized. We are perfectly happy with each other's clocks. But now imagine you start moving. And I'm with my clock. I'm not moving. Your clock is moving. That means in the beginning, when the light pulse took off here, you were here. Somewhat later, you're there. And somewhat later, you're there. So the light pulse goes like this. So my light pulse goes up and down. Yours goes zigzag. We all know the hypotenuse is longer than the vertical side. And that's precisely the amount by which your clock will appear slow to me. Again, why do I use a light clock? Why not one with uh, you know, springs and so on? Because we don't know how they work. But we know everything we need to know about light. Longer path means longer time, because speed of light is constant. So we know this will be slower than this. But even more interestingly, if you ask this person what he thinks about me, he will say, my clock is going up and down. This, clock, this guy's clock is going that way. This is how it's possible for each person to accuse the other person of having a slow clock. You can see it's very simple. The clock signal goes up and down only to the person holding it. To any other person, it's taking a longer path, and therefore it runs slow. So again, uh, if you're Einstein, you will get nervous at this point, because this leads to what's called a paradox, a paradox in which the two clocks are eventually compared. Then you can ask yourself, uh, which clock is going to be behind, which clock is going to be ahead. And that's usually stated in the form of a clock of a twin paradox. So you've got these twins, and one twin is on the ground, and the other twin goes on a very long trip at a high velocity, loops around, and comes back. And the twin's heart is like a clock. All biological processes are like clocks. I'm a clock. If you've got enough time, sit around and watch me get old. Okay, the hair will fall off. David's already uh, uncharitably referred to my hairstyle. <laughs> then all kinds of teeth will fall off by counting the number of teeth. You can measure time in some approximate form. So human body is a clock. The rate at which cells divide is a clock. So every clock has to slow down the same way. Because if I'm in a train and one clock is slowed down and one hasn't slowed down, the difference will betray the motion. So the biological clock will also slow down. That means the twin who went on this orbit for 100 years may come back only two years older. And the question is, can that twin tell to the twin on the ground, say, look, I didn't actually go anywhere. You went the opposite way. You must be younger than me. Then we have a paradox. But the paradox is resolved by pointing out the twin who went on the rocket has lost the claim, cannot claim that the person was always in an inertial frame of reference, in a frame that obeyed a relative uh, Newton's laws. In other words, when you go on a rocket, during takeoff, you're accelerating. You cannot deny you're moving. You go somewhere, you stop decelerating. Turn around, you're accelerating. Come back to your Earth, you're decelerating. You're doing a lot of stuff during which you cannot say you're not the one who's moving. That's why whenever you compare clocks, you will find out that the comparison puts one of the clocks in a position where it has to accelerate. So you don't have a paradox. So there's all kinds of other things, like length and so on. I don't want to discuss that now. I just want to conclude by saying what Einstein said about uh, gravity. So towards uh, 10 years later, after this theory came out, he was dissatisfied with one aspect of his theory, which is that it only said people going at constant uniform velocity are equivalent, namely if you're going at constant uniform velocity with respect to another person, you can claim you're not moving. 
But the minute you're accelerating, we agreed, you got to throw up your hands and say, okay, I agree, I'm accelerating, things are happening in my frame. Well, he found a way by which you can deny you're accelerating even then. And this was his procedure. So imagine uh, you are in this train, and let's say the train is accelerating. So everything is sliding to the back of the train. Anything that's not nailed down, it's all moving back. So you have to agree you're accelerating. But you can say, no, I'm not doing anything. I'm sitting still, but somebody has put a gigantic planet, a huge mass, behind my train, and the gravitational pull of that mass is pulling everything down. That's why everything is falling towards this wall. It's just gravity. I'm not moving at all. Now, why gravity? Why not something else? Why not electromagnets? Because electromagnets will pull charged objects or metals, may not pull non-metals. You want everything to fall at the same rate for you to mistake it, for you to not to be able to tell whether you're accelerating or in the field of some other force. And gravity is the only force which pulls everything equally. It's the only force that can be confused for accelerated motion. And that's how the theory of generalizing this principle automatically brings in gravitation. So this is a theory he developed over several years and is uniformly considered to be one of the finest inventions of the human mind. And every time you talk about it, you get a pleasure, and it's my pleasure to be part of the community that works on these problems and to share some of my pleasure with you. Thank you very much. Hi, Dr. Rinkar. <laughs> I'm a big fan of your online lectures. Uh, I've been watching them for like a year now, so it's pretty cool to see you in real life. Um, Thank you. Okay, I wrote it down so I don't flood this. Uh, if according to Einstein, there's no all-encompassing now uh, or simultaneous events, and everything is measured relative to something else, uh, doesn't that mean past, present, and future all exist simultaneously in space-time and therefore our future is predetermined? Uh, you have asked me a lot of things. Uh, I'll tell you the part I know about, which is that in the theory of relativity, the notion of what is past and what is present and what is future is actually negotiable. Normally, when you draw time, you draw a line like this and say, this is now, that's later, below the thing is earlier. And that's a very clear notion. In Einstein's theory, it doesn't happen like that. Uh, there is uh, some part of your future that can be called later. So if this is your time, and this is your space, then there is a shape like this called a cone. This is what you would call now in the Newtonian days. In the Einstein's world, and this is, will be called your future, this will be called your past. In the Einstein world, that is called your future, that's called your past, in the sense that everybody will agree that this event inside that cone occurs after this event, and this event occurs before this one. But how about something here? It has not happened yet. It's time is zero here, and maybe time is five seconds there. It's not happened yet, so you can say that's in my future, but there's nothing you can do about that event. If you hear that something terrible is going to happen here, you open an envelope, it says something terrible is going to happen here. You cannot do anything about it. If you wanted to do something by sending a signal, that signal would travel faster than light. Therefore, this is not really called your future for two reasons. First, you cannot affect, affect your future. Secondly, you can find another observer for whom that event occurs before this event. So uh, maybe you should then Go listen to those uh, online lectures where I give you a longer answer than this. So past, present, and future are muddied up somewhat, 
but in a very definite way. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for uh, giving your lecture. My question is, um, Einstein's really famous for uh, imagining what it would be like to ride along a beam of light. Um, my question to you is, how would you imagine riding upon a, a theoretical gravitational wave? Would the universe appear different at maximum amplitude and lower amplitude since you discuss waves with everyone? Uh, so you want me to ride with the gravitational wave, you mean? Assuming it goes the speed of light as well. Yeah, so I think, first of all, uh, the speed of light is a velocity that's forbidden to both me and to you. Uh, only objects like certain, maybe some neutrinos, maybe not them, at least light can travel at the speed of light. And if you travel at the speed of light and you're a massless particle, by the way, everything happens to you at the same time in that light. Your entire life history is collapsed into your birth, your death, applying for college, all that stuff, all in one flash. The runs equation. So that's, uh, so by and large, I never think about what things look like to a light beam. But for other things which are traveling comparable to light but not equal to light, there are already many interesting things. For example, if I tell you the velocity of light is the upper limit, you can say, okay, you're going to live about 100 years. Uh, the furthest you can ever go in the universe is 100 light years. But that's not true. You can go a million light years. But if you travel fast enough, uh, you won't age that much. And you can travel 1 million light years, and you can come back. You cannot show your photographs to your friends because they'll all be dead by then. But you can go as far as you want and come back. So I think the science is uh, more interesting than science fiction because these are things you can really do. Here's something you can do. Take a look at the mirror. If you don't like what you see, I cannot help you. But if you like what you see and you want to preserve it, you just have to get into a spaceship and travel as close as you can to the speed of light for as long as you want. And that puts an end to your aging process. You won't think you're aging slowly, but when you come back, you can have a good laugh at all the other people who age. Thank you. My name's Julian. Just to put that in perspective, if you travel for a year on the space station at 18,000 miles an hour, how much younger are you than the people who stayed on Earth? Yeah, some tiny, very tiny amount. Uh, there's a way to calculate it. If you give me the speed and you tell me how long you were doing that, I can tell you uh, how many out of a milliseconds of life you have gained by doing that. That is a non-zero answer, but it's pretty small. The only time when you really see an effect on lifetime is with subatomic particles. There are particles which are created in the upper atmosphere which have no business coming to Earth because they don't have enough time to come here even if they travel at the speed of light because they live for a short time. But it turns out the life you calculate is as seen by the particle. So when the particle comes from the cosmos down to the Earth, it thinks it has lived a very short time but we think it has lived a very long time and managed to come from there to here. Also, many uh, particles which are trapped in accelerators going at very high speed will also live a very long time. But you've got to push the, you've got to go close to the speed of light to really see effects. That's one reason why relativity doesn't play a big role in our daily life, because we never really travel at that speed. Right? Maybe it's useful in GPS systems. Quantum mechanics is much more part of our lives. All the transistors and everything we use is made up of realizing quantum mechanics. Now, I wouldn't go far as to say you understand the human brain with quantum mechanics. Some people have asked me that. Do you need quantum mechanics to understand the brain? And my answer is yes, if the brain is small enough. <laughs> for, professor, thanks again for reviewing relativity with us. Uh, but talking about quantum things, what about quantum entanglement? Is there any violation of uh, going faster than the speed of light that you've separated particles and they instantly uh, turn, supposedly? To the best of my knowledge, there is no violation of causality, as I understand it, from entanglement. So, But it is a subject which I thought was pretty much all settled in the 1930s. But it's extremely vibrant, and the four months I've spent at KATP, I heard a lot of fascinating talks. 
about entanglement. It's of interest to many, many disciplines which you would think are unrelated. It's interesting in condensed matter physics, interesting for people who do string theory, people who study black holes. So entanglement is back in business and it's got all kinds of possibilities we didn't realize. So drop in for a visit. Thank you very much, Shankar. Okay.